Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, it looks like it's noon. I think we can get started. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't know me, my name is Ed Hallrott. I'm the program coordinator uh, for IDEA uh, Rhode Island CTR. And uh, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, host today's uh, two outstanding speakers. Uh, as you know, uh, the Clinical and Translational Seminar Series is an opportunity to showcase outstanding clinical and translational research of, uh, of recent faculty awardees, among, other, among others. And uh, in this case, we have two outstanding um, presentations to, uh, to look forward to. Uh, the first one will be presented by Dr. Taylor Von Ash. Uh, Dr. Von Ash is an assistant professor of behavioral and social sciences and in, in, in the Center for Health Promotion and Health Equity at, at the uh, Brown University School of Public Health. Uh, she joined Brown as a presidential postdoctoral fellow in 2018 after having received her SCD in social behavioral sciences and public health nutrition from Harvard University. She has an MPH from Yale University and her undergraduate training was at UCLA. Dr. Von Ash's research focuses on obesity prevention in racial and ethnic minority and low income families, uh, but most of her research uh, uh, that will be discussed today is focused on parenting behaviors and child health outcomes, uh, uh, the, tar uh, and additionally targeting parents' own uh, health behaviors. Uh, Dr. Von Ash utilizes both qualitative and quantitative data to better understand the factors that contribute to health disparities and design innovative intervention approaches to uh, address them. Uh, the title of the talk, as you see on the screen, is Feasibility, Acceptability, and Preliminary Efficacy of an Innovative Physical Activity Intervention Delivered to Mothers During Their Children's Sports Practice. Uh, for those during the talk, uh, we'll have a, 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 at the end of the presentation, we'll have an opportunity to answer any questions. So please put any questions into the uh, chat. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Van Ash, please. Sorry, thank you. Um, and thank you all for joining. Um, and so I'm presenting on an intervention called Moms on the Move, um, or MOMS for short. Um, and MOMS is an innovative community-based physical activity promotion intervention for mothers attending their children's sports practices. Uh, myself and Bess Marcus are MPIs on the grant. Um, and so this is a quick overview of what I'll discuss, um, briefly go through the rationale for the intervention, describe the intervention, discuss the specific aims of this pilot study, talk a bit about our approach, and then I'll present some um, preliminary findings around feasibility, acceptability, and efficacy, um, and then wrap by talking about some next steps and making some acknowledgments. Uh, so in terms of public health significance and the rationale for this intervention, uh, it's no surprise to any of us that physical activity is an important health behavior. Uh, insufficient physical activity is associated with increased risk for obesity and various chronic diseases. Um, and because of that, there are national guidelines around physical activity, um, with those being for adults, 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous physical activity, and at least two days a week of strength training activities. Um, However, when we look at physical activity in uh, the general population here in the U.S., we see that there are differences across groups, uh, such that women are less active than men. Um, and then when we look at women specifically, we see that mothers are less active than women without children. Um, we also can see persistent racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities, uh, such that um, women of color, particularly Black and Hispanic women, um, and low income and low ed educated women um, are less likely to meet the national guidelines than their non-Hispanic white and higher SES counterparts. And there are different barriers that are cited for why um, women have trouble meeting national guidelines around physical activity. Um, and particularly, uh, you know, several of these barriers are cited for um, being contributions to some of these disparities we see across groups. And so for black and Hispanic low and low income women, uh, we often see these commonly cited PA physical activity barriers. Um, moms often say they don't have enough time, they have competing responsibilities, um, and that they're prioritizing their children's needs over their own. 
Uh, moms also often report lack of child care, um, preventing them from engaging in physical activity. Um, there's also common uh, reports of lack of social support and then lack of transportation and cost. And so the Moms on the Move intervention was really designed to address these barriers um, in an innovative way. And the way we do this is by pairing components of prior successful culturally tailored and theoretically driven uh, physical activity interventions with an in-person group component. Um, and so these are in-person group exercise sessions and it's delivered in a community setting where moms are already spending substantial time. Um, and a lot of the uh, previous, the prior successful culturally tailored uh, interventions are from Bess Marcus and her team. Um, and then we designed and delivered this intervention uh, via partnership with a local youth football and cheerleading organization um, that predominantly serves low-income Black and Hispanic families. And so in terms of the intervention components, um, there are really three. Uh, as I mentioned, first is the group PA sessions. These happen in person during children's practices, so they're at the practice field. Um, they were offered three times per week. Um, and were designed to be an hour long, really with the goal, um, you know, having a brief warm up and cool down, but the goal of allowing for 50 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per session. Uh, they were led by a certified trainer this past year, who was actually a mom of the organization that we, in the organization that we partnered with. Um, and importantly, we decided to include childcare um, during the sessions. And so by nature, moms, um, at least one of their children, right? Because for eligibility in the study, they had a child participating in either football or cheerleading with the organization. That child was supervised um, because they're engaged in practice, but some moms had other additional children um, who might not be quite as old enough to participate in the sport or may not participate for various reasons. And so we had RAs there um, providing activities to children while the moms were exercising. And so in proximity, but we'd bring a blanket and had some magnetic tiles and coloring books for the children. Um, and then lastly, we provided all equipment. So each mom received a duffel bag with things like um, a jump rope, um, resistance bands. Um, they each received a yoga mat um, and small uh, free weights as well that they could keep and bring to each session. And then also, you know, use on their own time if, if desired. Uh, the second component was uh, physical activity goal setting. And so this used, utilized a motivational interviewing and was conducted via phone by a trained research assistant. Um, and all participants conducted um, a goal setting session at the start of the program and then also midway through to revise and update um, and adjust their goals as needed. And then finally, the last component uh, was written materials, and these were in the form of stage matched physical activity manuals and tip sheets, and they were emailed to participants weekly. And so the goal setting and the written materials were really um, adopted from Bess's prior uh, successful physical activity interventions, and then we paired that with the in-person component in the community setting. So here you can see our study logo um, and the specific aims of this pilot study. Uh, first was to convene a community advisory board to enhance participant acceptability and work through any feasibility issues with implementation. And then second, we wanted to conduct an open pilot trial of the intervention um, and to assess feasibility, acceptability, um, and examine preliminary efficacy. In terms of approach, we did a staged approach with the first stage really focused on intervention refinement. Um, and so to achieve specific aim one, we successfully convened a community advisory board of stakeholders. Um, this included individuals who were um, leaders within the organization. So we had um, the president of the organization as well as two coaches, um, and then two mothers also were on the community advisory board, um, including the mother uh, who was the certified trainer who ran the in-person component. Um, we solicited input on the intervention content and structure from the CAB and made modifications. Um, so one example of this was uh, practice is generally two hours for the children, but we knew that we only wanted to run the exercise for the moms one hour, and we were weighing the pros and cons of using the first hour or the second hour. Um, and from discussion with the cab, we ended up doing it in the middle of practice so that moms were able to kind of get their kids settled and set up exercise and then be available uh, for the end of practices when coaches might have announcements or schedule, you know, say things about schedule changes and so on. Um, also, before the intervention, 
during the intervention and after the intervention, uh, we met with the CAB to solicit input on intervention implementation um, to kind of inform what would work well, um, you know, beforehand and then inform changes that we might make in the future uh, if we scale. And then for the approach for the um, specific aim two, we conducted an open pilot trial. Um, this was a single group um, design where we ran the intervention for eight weeks and participants completed assessments at baseline eight weeks and then 12 weeks. And the purpose of the 12 weeks was really to see um, well, first, I want to say that the 12 weeks was still during season, um, during the sports season. So it was at the end of the sports season. But we wanted to see once we removed the formal structure of the in-person component, um, if moms would still utilize practice time to exercise now that they had the tools and equipment um, to do so. So that was kind of our follow up or maintenance period. Um, and we assessed feasibility and acceptability using predetermined benchmarks. And for preliminary efficacy, we examined associations between intervention dose received and changes in moderate to vigor vigorous physical activity, um, which was measured using the seven-day physical activity recall, um, which was administered by trained research assistants. So for feasibility and acceptability, um, we were able to successfully demonstrate feasibility. Um, and so actually, let me back up a second. This program just ran this past fall. Um, so we recruited during the month of August. The intervention was run during the month of September and October. And then at the end of November was that final assessment. Um, and so we were able to um, demonstrate feasibility by successfully meeting our recruitment target of 30 participants. We actually ended up enrolling 35 women um, and we had the full month of August to recruit, but we reached recruitment um, goal within three weeks. Uh, we also successfully met our retention target of at least 80%, only two participants withdrew. Um, so we had a 94% retention rate. Um, however, improvements are needed to meet our assessment target. Um, which was set at 80%. Uh, we successfully uh, collected baseline physical activity data from all of the participants, um, but for eight weeks and 12 weeks, we only had physical activity data for uh, 43 to 57% of participants. And so, um, you know, lessons learned from this in terms of future grant for an R01, um, you know, a couple of things we talked about was potentially increasing the incentives, um, notably at baseline, the physical activity data was collected all in person. Um, and at follow up, it was mostly via phone, and it's really hard to get people on the phone. So, um, you know, being able to offer that in person at subsequent visits as well. And then lastly, you know, for a fully scaled, you know, what we anticipate for an R01 would be to also have objective physical activity data. Um, so um, hopefully we don't have as much missingness. Um, in terms of acceptability, that varied um, across participants with 52% of participants um, attending physical activity sessions and 51% um, completing goal setting sessions. And on the figure on the right here, you can see approximately half of participants did not attend the group PA group based physical activity sessions, while about a quarter attended just a few sessions and another quarter uh, attended more regularly. Before I get into the preliminary efficacy, oh, oh actually before that too, uh, just to talk about participant satisfaction. Um, here on the right, you can see uh, the responses to the question, how satisfied were you with the Moms on the Move intervention? 75% of participants said very, 19% somewhat, and only 6% said a little with nobody saying not at all. Um, so high satisfaction, at least from the people that we had data from. Um, in terms of the question, how pleasing were the PA sessions. Again, 75% very, 25% somewhat, and nobody said a little or not at all. Uh, for the question, how beneficial were the PA sessions? 56% said very, 31% somewhat, 6% a little, and 6% not at all. And then when asked, do you feel if you learned something um, about exercising from participating in Moms on the Move, 100% said yes, and 100% also said that they would recommend uh, the program to a friend. Uh, so now before I get into uh, preliminary efficacy, I wanna share a little bit about the sample. Um, 
And so on the right here, you have sample demographics, um, both for the full sample uh, for which we have data, the full analytic sample, uh, as well as looking specifically at those who do not meet guidelines uh, at baseline. So this is people who are engaging in less than 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity at baseline. Um, and 62% of the participants weren't meeting guidelines at baseline. Um, there were no notable differences between meeting versus not meeting guidelines at baseline in terms of sociodemographics, uh, but we broke it out this way because in a lot of uh, physical activity promotion interventions, there's often eligibility criteria um, around considering what baseline activity is. And so typically people who are already meeting guidelines would not necessarily be enrolled, um, but by study design and really wanting to leverage the community of the organization and not wanting to exclude some moms, um, we allowed all moms to enroll, but we wanted to look specifically at how the experience or changes in physical activity uh, might be different from those who weren't meeting the guidelines versus those who were. All right, so here on the table on the left, you can see the average reported weekly um, minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity at each time point. At baseline, it was 106 minutes, eight weeks, 136 minutes, so about a 30 minute increase. And then at 12 weeks, uh, it basically went back to baseline. Um, and then when we're looking on the right here at the correlations between um, session attendance and changes in moderate to vigorous physical activity. Surprisingly, when we look at the full sample, the correlations are actually in the opposite direction than we would expect. But when we're just looking at those who were not meeting the guidelines uh, for the, mention, the reasons I just mentioned, uh, we see the relationship in the expected direction um, with correlation coefficients of 0.35 at eight weeks and 0.74 at 12 weeks. And notably, even with such a small sample size, um, the p-value for 12 weeks was 0 0.001. Um, we also looked at, um, we also considered dichotomizing session attendance um, based on the distribution I showed uh, of, you know, how many people, how many sessions folks attended. Um, and when we also consider dichotomizing uh, the outcome of moderate to vigorous physical activity using that 150 minute threshold and the correlations were consistent uh, regardless for both eight and 12 weeks. And so in a nutshell, uh, what, we, what we kind of infer from this is that intervention engagement, specifically session attendance, was associated with increased MVPA among those not meeting national guidelines at baseline with significant effects at follow-up. So I wanna talk a little bit about some implications, next steps, and future directions uh, as I wrap up my presentation. Uh, so implement implications are that moms on the move may be an effective intervention for increasing MVPA among those not meeting national guidelines. Um, and I also wanna note that the scalability potential of this intervention is tremendous um, because 54% of US children participate in organized sports. Um, and this could be an effective setting for implementing interventions specifically that target um, black and Hispanic families, which can be sometimes hard to reach and engage. Um, in terms of next steps, we plan to conduct additional preliminary analyses. Um, so for example, we also assess strength training outcomes. So we'll look at that. Uh, we plan to compare results with the 2022 pilot. So uh, two years ago, we actually worked with this organization um, as well and just piloted the in-person component. So those participants of that year did not get their written materials or the goal, or the goal setting. And so we can see um, if there's an added benefit to those components. Um, and then we also need to analyze um, the exit interview data. So all participants completed exit interviews. Um, and so we will kind of analyze that and see what else, you know, what other lessons can be learned. Um, we actually submitted an R01 for this intervention back in June, which scored pretty well, but we're gearing up for resubmission. And so in that resubmission, we will add the, the data I just presented to strengthen our preliminary study section. Um, and also to kind of inform some of the implementation um, and uh, assessment strategies based on lessons learned. And then of course, we'll submit conference abstracts and manuscripts and uh, of course, disseminate findings to our community partner. In terms of future directions, if um, Moms on Move is shown to be efficacious in a fully powered RCT, uh, we see a lot of exciting directions to take this work. Um, 
a couple of those being expansion or translation to other sports that have different kind of practice structures and maybe indoors versus outdoor sports, um, you know, different season sports as well. We uh, want to examine longer term effects. Um, so outside of the season, most sports seasons are only a few months long. Um, so seeing what some of the longer term effects would be, um, not only on mothers, but also on children's physical activity. Um, we might also consider including dad. So that's some of the feedback that we got. Interestingly, there's kind of mixed feelings about, you know, some, some women preferring to just have a women only exercise group and then others being more open to it. And we had a couple dads that actually was like, Hey, can we participate? Um, so that's something we'll consider. And then uh, lastly, the potential of other behavior change. Uh, interventions implemented in during in this setting. So practice is usually 6 to 8 p.m., um, which is prime dinner time. And so we've observed that a lot of families are kind of rushing for dinner or getting fast food either before or after practice. And so definitely interested in adding a nutrition component, but also could think about other behaviors as well. All right, so I'll wrap up quickly with some acknowledgements. Um, thank you to Advanced CTR for funding this pilot study. Um, thanks to my study team, Beth Marcus and Shira Dunsinger, who are amazing mentors, Saganda Gupta, who helped with data and entry and cleaning, Rachel Edgar, our project coordinator, Esther Solis Boseta, uh, the study RA, and then the student RAs, um, Belinda, Michael, Hawa, and Fadila, too. And then last but not least, um, I have to thank our community partner, uh, the Mount Hope Cowboys, um, especially President Demetrius, coaches Lorenzo and Herlin, and Priscilla, uh, who's a team mom who ran the program. And happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. That's very uh, in innovative intervention and uh, it's exciting that uh, you've uh, uh, submitted an R01 and gotten some um, good good feedback. Uh, there is a question from Ronnie. Uh, have you considered doing a hybrid type effectiveness implementation trial where you could simultaneously assess the effectiveness of the intervention, AIMS 1 and 2, while also assessing the implementation context, A3, guided by an implementation science framework to inform a next study that would lead to more of, of, of the scalability that you would like to see. There is a great, there's an article in the chat uh, for uh, thinking about all of this. Um, so any uh, comments, uh, responses? So I haven't thought about that and I'm not as familiar with that type of trial. Um, so I will definitely look into it. Um, I have though been thinking about broader kind of implementation science and uh, just with the R01. So we are proposing to do a waitlist control uh, partnering with eight organizations and thinking a lot about how the implementation it might of the intervention might be different with each organization. Um, so just in terms of the resources uh, for the Cowboys, they had a mom who was a certified trainer. Uh, for other organizations, that might not be the case. We might not. We might need to bring someone in. Uh, practice space and location kind of varies across organizations. Practice structure varies. Um, how they handle cancellations due to weather um, and how they communicate with parents. So um, the Cowboys actually use an app that we were able to use to notify parents of, you know, about assessments and changes and things like that, but not all organizations do. And so um, there's, I think, a lot of variability between organizations that are going to be important with regard to uh, implementation. Um, but I will definitely check out this article um, and consider this design. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned the participation, the attendance uh, seemed to be in, a, a concern. From the exit interviews, do you have any uh, insights as to what the, the barriers might be in terms of the participation? Yeah, so it actually worked a little bit to our favor in this pilot because it was a single group and we wanted to have that variability in attendance. Um, but I think the main reason for that, uh, for this organization, and again, this might vary, um, is during the summer months, most organizations are practicing five days a week. Once school starts, it shifts to three days a week. Um, but there are five or six different age groups per organization. 
And within a single organization, the younger teams or the older teams might practice on different days. And so, as I mentioned, we offered the sessions three days a week. So those were on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. And that mirrored the 12-year-old children's football schedule um, because Priscilla, who was running the program, um, her husband coaches that age group. And so for the eight-year-olds, for instance, they practice Monday, Wednesday, Saturday. And so they only had one overlap day with when the sessions were offered. And theoretically, moms were invited to come on any day. But the point of the intervention is to really be convenient. We didn't necessarily expect them to show up to exercise on days that their kids didn't have practice. Um, and so for the R01, uh, we need to increase how many, you know, make sure that um, a session is offered at each available practice, not just three times a week. So three times a week to each mother during their child's practice. So some uh, serious logistical challenges in working yeah. with the organizations. Okay. Uh, there's one other question that came to my mind was uh, any, uh, is there any effort to obtain the uh, input from the children? How do they view this and is this, uh, you know, uh, do they support this activity of their, of, their, of their mothers and so on? Yeah, that's great. We hadn't thought about that, um, but I, I love that idea. Um, I it guess could be, related. It could, could be positive feedback. And, for you know, sure. Related, a couple of things that were interesting that kind of came out. It, we haven't fully analyzed the qualitative data, but things that um, we've heard was moms actually, so the way that the exercises were structured was really kind of high intensity interval training. Um, and some of the moms were saying like, I want to play football too, um, which I think relates to wanting to, you know, learn more about the sport that their child is engaged with. And then potentially that could have benefits to the mom and child outside of practice time, right. Is them playing together and being outside and even after the season ends. So um, those are some of the things we thought about in terms of, it seems like there's an interest from the moms to make the exercise more relevant to the children. Um, but yeah, we haven't thought about actually collecting the data from the kids. That would be really interesting to see. Hey, thank you. Uh, so I don't see any other questions at this point. So uh, again, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. It was really uh, exciting to hear of your work and good luck with the uh, with the resubmission of your R01 and with the uh, uh, efforts to expand the studies into uh, in, into other areas. But it sounds like uh, you had a, a, a great participation with this particular pilot group and uh, and it's good to have that community uh, co connection. Uh, we really uh, in, in encourage that. So thanks, thanks again. Yeah, thank you. The, the last thing I'll say is that um, one thing that was really excited by you work partnering with this organization was recruitment was so easy. Um, and that kind of builds on like the already sense of community within the organization. One mom would be like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get my friends to do it. And so there was almost this kind of snowball recruitment um, and just being able to leverage the the expertise and the resources that they had. Um, you know, they really took pride in it as well. And with getting letters of support for the R01, you know, one of the benefits of Rhode Island is everyone kind of knows everybody. And so once I kind of said the Cowboys were on board, a bunch of organizations were like, yeah, we want to do it too. And we want to be able to offer this to mom. So um, it, it was really exciting. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, so I think we can move on to the second half of the uh, today's uh, presentations. And uh, let me introduce uh, our next speaker, Dr. Louisa Thompson, uh, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior, uh, and is uh, in the uh, let's see in the department, yeah, and at um, and also a neuropsychologist in uh, in the Memory and Aging Program at Butler Hospital. Want to make sure to put that plug in. Uh, her research aims uh, are to uh, al aligned with using uh, smartphone apps and other novel digital tools to improve cognitive screening uh, methods for use in older adult populations. In part particular, she seeks to validate and implement digital assessment approaches that are feasible for use in, a, in primary care settings and are sensitive to subtle cognitive and neuropathological changes associated with Alzheimer's disease and related uh, dementia. Uh, so the, uh, again, if you uh, uh, could enter your questions into the chat, we can uh, cover them, uh, try to respond to them at the end of the, uh, of the presentation. Uh, so the title of Dr. Thompson's talk is uh, 
digital approaches to detecting cognitive decline among older adults in primary care settings. Dr. Thompson. Great, thank you so much. Um, it's really great to be here and I'm excited to talk to you all about um, my research funded by Advanced CTR. So just a quick overview of what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm primarily gonna focus on a study called DigiCog Primary Care uh, and go over the pilot work that we've done for this study uh, during the past year. So I'll give you some preliminary results and then talk about uh, how we're using those results to inform the next phase of the study. And if we have time, I will talk a little bit about an additional project that I'm doing, um, which is a survey of primary care providers in Rhode Island. So as many of you know, uh, rates of, of Alzheimer's disease are growing, and this means that we increasingly have many more patients uh, with memory problems than we have specialists that can provide uh, screening and long-term care um, for older adults with Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, and another issue that we have um, with this growing aging population and rates of Alzheimer's disease is that the traditional uh, methods that we have for cognitive screening, um, paper pencil measures, um, as well as uh, diagnostic tools like lumbar puncture and amyloid PET scans, um, these are often hard to access. Uh, and they can also be uh, quite costly or invasive in the case of um, PET scans and, and CSF. So we really need to address this. Um, and we think that one way that we could potentially do this is first by improving uh, the first line screening that uh, patients receive um, in more general medical settings, uh, such as primary care clinics. And we know that due to uh, inequities ingrained in our healthcare system, unfortunately, many older adults who are at, at very high risk for Alzheimer's disease are not necessarily connected with a primary care provider, um, but this is at least a starting place for us to reach the broader older adult population um, in, in Rhode Island. And this is an exciting time uh, actually to revisit how we do screening for cognitive concerns in primary care. Uh, we actually have a newly approved treatment uh, for Alzheimer's disease, the first in 15 years um, available this year, as well as uh, a host of different digital tools for uh, conducting cognitive assessments. And we are also starting to uh, develop blood tests that can help detect the disease early. So there's a number of different uh, areas of work kind of having a, a primary care focus here in the Memory and Aging program recently. I'm gonna to talk to you um, about DigiCog primary care. Um, and as I mentioned, um, maybe about a, a survey that we've been doing as well. So DigiCog primary care is a five-year study. We're utilizing digital cognitive screening and blood tests. And our primary goal is to engage primary care providers and their patients to co-design and trial a screening protocol for detecting cognitive problems earlier. And in this process, we are really emphasizing um, minimizing in-clinic usage time um, and recruiting underrepresented groups. We're also providing training for primary care primary care providers and how to give feedback to patients and talk to them about their memory concerns and cognitive test results. And we're offering um, fast track referrals to the Butler Memory and Aging Program as needed if uh, the study does identify uh, older adults who are showing signs of mild cognitive impairment. And in total, we're recruiting 10 primary care providers and 10 patients um, uh, sorry, 100 patients over the course of, of this five-year project. Um, and for the past year, what I've been doing is a pilot phase uh, for the study. This has been funded by an advanced CTR pilot grant. And our goal here is really just to test out um, some very basic uh, questions about these cognitive screening tools and how we can use them maybe at home and also in the primary care clinic. So first of all, we wanna know is it feasible to use this type of technology in the older adult population in these two different contexts? Um, and do older adults and their providers find these sorts of digital interfaces um, acceptable? 
And then the, to the extent that we can, um, with limited pilot data, we wanted to test out if these tools seem to be similarly accurate across different demographic groups, um, and, and also understand how they compare to our existing uh, gold standard screening tools. So for our pilot, uh, we're enrolled adults ages 55 to 85 who do not already have a dementia diagnosis. Um, they had to have either memory concerns or a first degree family history of dementia. Um, so something to put them um, at risk for, for Alzheimer's disease. Um, for the pilot, all participants had to speak and understand English. Um, and we are working uh, for this next phase to uh, change that to both English and Spanish. The study was conducted at home, online, either on participant smartphones or home computers, um, as well as in primary care offices. And the general flow of uh, steps for the study involved phone screening and initial consent for the patient participants, um, who then went on to complete a 10-minute online screening test. And they did this in advance of an upcoming uh, annual wellness or, or routine follow-up with their primary care provider. Then when they went into the clinic for that appointment, um, they would do a five minute tablet based assessment with their provider. And then finally, they would complete a MOCA and cognitive health consultation. This was different um, across our different sites. Uh, sometimes we, the research team would come in and do this consultation. Sometimes behavioral health uh, would do it as a, as a handoff. Um, and sometimes uh, the primary care provider would actually do it as part of that annual wellness process. Uh, and then finally, we are co collecting feedback um, from both patients and providers via surveys uh, and uh, qualitative interviews. So what are we using for recruitment? Uh, we've been actually increasing our recruitment strategies to encompass a number of different approaches. Um, we first started out using EMR, and uh, particularly for our Care New England um, practices, uh, to search for patients in the correct age range for the study, um, and then send those people a letter in the mail, uh, inviting them to join the study. And those were uh, letters uh, co-signed by myself and the primary care provider. We also sent messages to participants of those uh, participating providers in my chart. And then uh, just in the last month, we've been uh, making cold calls to participants who, um, potential participants who have my chart and actually indicate in their my chart profile that they're open to being contacted for research studies. Um, and so we've already been contacting uh, a, a large number of people that way as well. And then also recently, we have been doing more direct referrals from participating providers. Um, some providers have told us that they prefer to just identify people who might be good candidates for the study when they're doing their chart review for upcoming visits. Um, and so with some of our, our newer um, provider participants, that's been um, a productive approach. We have also put out waiting room flyers so far. Those, um, as far as we've been able to track, have not yielded um, any, uh, any interest in the study. And next, a uh, little bit about the tools that we're using. So I mentioned we're doing um, an online measure. This is called the Boston Online Cognitive Assessment. It's self-administered by the participant. Um, they basically receive a link uh, to go complete the test. Um, and they can do that really anywhere, um, on a phone, on a tablet, on their home computer, um, a computer in the library. Um, so it's pretty flexible. It just requires a web browser. Um, and similar to some of our other more standard paper pencil measures, it covers a number of different cognitive domains, including memory and executive function. Um, and this test is actually um, free and, and openly available. Um, and it was developed by Andre Vyshevsky up at um, Boston University. Uh, for our in-clinic testing, we're using something called the uh, DCR, Digital Clock and Recall. Um, this is actually uh, just a tablet version of the Minicog, uh, which many of our providers are already familiar with as a paper pencil screening tool. Um, so this was a really convenient tool to introduce. Um, the DCR, uh, which is uh, provided by Linus Health, is really set up to be provider friendly. Um, it takes only five minutes to administer. Um, it walks the participant through 
the assessment and the, um, the, the scoring is all automated. So the provider doesn't have to do much during that visit in order to um, get the results of the testing. Um, so they can actually discuss that with the um, patient if they want to right after the assessment's been done. Uh, there's been a fair amount of research already done on this measure. Uh, it does seem to be sensitive to mild cognitive impairment and distinguish um, mild cognitive impairment from normal cognition. Um, it's also been shown to be uh, sensitive to Alzheimer's disease biomarkers. So as I mentioned, the, the DCR is meant to be very provider friendly. It automatically generates a report um, of a score out of five points. Um, and that score integrates both um, a three-word um, learning and recall phase, as well as a clock drawing um, task. And so the provider can look and see whether or not the, um, the score is considered you know, uh, impaired, borderline, or normal based on their normative data. Um, and if they want to, there's a lot more detail in the report sort of about how that score breaks down um, and what, what it might indicate. So our provider participants have really been key to the success of this project. Um, and I would say the number one lesson that we've learned during the piloting phase is that recruiting the providers is actually uh, much more challenging than the patients. Um, in hindsight, you know, this isn't uh, surprising, especially from what we've learned from doing focus groups. Um, it's just incredibly difficult for um, primary care providers to take the time to uh, integrate something new, uh, especially just for research into their practice. Um, and so we've been really grateful to have this piloting phase of the study where we've really worked closely <clears throat> with the primary care providers to refine our protocol and make it as streamlined and easy for them to uh, implement as possible. So we've been working with um, folks at Family Care Center in Pawtucket, um, Family Medicine in East Greenwich, those are both uh, Care New England practices, and then also um, with providers in, uh, at Thunder Miss in Warwick. So what do providers do in our study? Uh, our providers are actually treated as participants in the study as well, um, because we are collecting really valuable data from them about the feasibility and acceptability of these digital approaches. Um, so the first thing they do is sign a consent form to participate. And then depending on um, the recruitment methods that they are most interested in, in using, we do have them review uh, the EMR generated list of eligible participants. Um, and this is just a light review to make sure that you know, participants on the list aren't deceased or, or haven't been um, you know, absent from the practice for, for many years. They then do about a 30 minute training to learn how to use that tablet-based DCR task that I was showing you. And then uh, when patients come in for uh, a visit and they happen to be a participant in our study, uh, they administer the Linus DCR during that appointment. And I'll talk to you a little bit in a minute about kind of what appointments uh, we're, we're able to do that kind of testing in. Um, and that's something that's coordinated by our uh, study coordinator, Molly, who's fantastic. Um, and so she makes sure that the provider knows that there's a participant coming in and works with the scheduling and front desk to, um, to make sure that everything is needed for that visit is in place. Uh, and then at the end of the, um, the uh, study, we have the participants complete uh, some surveys online and our providers in turn do a 15 minute phone interview with us. So this is at the end of the study, not for each participant. So just uh, a little bit of preliminary results. We're still analyzing the, the data from this piloting phase, which will close in March. Um, and we have really been uh, ramping up our enrollment in the last month. So we uh, the verdict is still out on some of these um, details. But I wanted to share some sort of interesting lessons and, and pieces of information from uh, this early stage of the project. Um, the first, as I you know, alluded to earlier was that we have um, more recently been doing direct calls to people who are signed up for my chart. Um, and this has yielded um, a much higher rate, 7.6% rate of um, successful screening 
uh, calls with participants as opposed to sort of passively sending invitations in my chart and definitely um, more successful than screening via, um, sorry, than recruiting via mailing. So we really got um, at the start of the study when we were focused on mailings primarily um, a, a really low hit rate for people calling about the study. So this my chart approach has been really useful. Um, we currently have 15 active participants, so people, you know, in the process of, of completing the study, eight of them have, um, an additional eight participants have completed. We had a number of people screen fail. Um, these are pretty much all due to, you know, not having those subjective cognitive concerns or the family history. Um, and during the next phase of the study, we will take away those requirements. So we'll be able to be even more inclusive um, during that screening process. And then we had a number of people um, who withdrew uh, primarily because they didn't want to, they had to have a separate scheduled visit for that cognitive consultation piece that I mentioned, um, and they didn't want to come in for that. Interestingly, we have seen um, very different rates of enrollment across our providers. Um, and this has primarily been driven just by the percentage of older adults um, that are seen in each person's practice. Uh, so this actually varies quite a bit from person to person. Um, and so we, we, we found that Dr. Rosenbaum and Dr. Anthony um, had more than 50% of their patients were you know, within our study age range. Um, so they, they yielded a higher number of, of uh, screening calls and uh, we also, you know, initially had some challenges at Thundermist because they have a different EMR system. And so um, with our first provider that we recruited there, we, we got off to a, a slower start. So just a brief, um, you know, snapshot of, of the demographics for the current sample. Um, so this is people who are in the study so far. Um, we do see we're, we're getting a pretty nice distribution in terms of age um, with a median age of 66 um, and median education is 15. So it's a, a little bit high, but um, again, we, we are seeing a good um, distribution there, at least so far. Interestingly, uh, the uh, slight majority of our participants have been male. Um, this is completely the opposite of what we typically see recruiting um, from within the memory and aging program here. Um, so we've been excited to, to have sort of this higher enrollment rate of, of men so far. Uh, we've been doing okay in terms of our initial ability to reach um, underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. Um, so we have, have enrolled about 22% of the sample as Black or African American, 78% um, white. And although we have not been very successful in reaching um, non, uh, Hispanic or Latino participants, we are hoping that in the next stage of the study, when we do include um, Spanish language uh, protocol available for the study, that that will, that will improve. Um, so I wanted to just briefly show this to you. We we don't have any significant correlations to look at yet with our um, with our different screening approaches, um, but we're really interested in doing you know head to head comparison of these different measures, and understanding in particular um, with this remote approach where people you know we can, we don't have any control over their environment, uh, time of day you know their state of mind when they're doing the screening, and we're really interested to see if these um, these uh, scores from the testing done at home map on to um, the testing scores uh, from the clinic. And most importantly, uh, do they relate to the MOCA? So the MOCA is um, kind of our gold standard screening tool, um, takes about 10 minutes to administer and is one of the few paper pencil, pencil measures that we have that we know can be sensitive to detect mild cognitive impairment. So I've already talked a little bit about some of the challenges and successes for the project, um, but just briefly, you know, as with uh, any sort of tech uh, uh, study, tech-based study, we did have some issues around the implementation of this um, tablet in the clinic. Um, we had some compatibility issues where, um, you know, we purchased iPads and then the system was upgraded and we needed a different type of iPad. Um, we had one issue where a, soft date, a software update was needed. Um, we actually couldn't administer the test 
um, at the patient's visit um, because of that. And then we've also had some issues with getting through for um, you know quick uh, support when needed. So Linus Health has um, made an effort to give us a, a direct phone number that we can call them, but um, they are a relatively small company and we're not always able to get somebody for support on the phone. Um, we did find that a Wi-Fi was pretty iffy in the primary care offices. Uh, and um, so two out of three of our, our uh, practices, we had to get um, Wi-Fi hotspots so that um, the tablet could be connected to that hotspot in order to do the assessment. Um, and our primary care providers, uh, you know, had uh, had a number of challenges in participating in, in the study. The first and, and biggest thing that we heard, you know, is time constraints, especially depending on the type of visit. Um, a routine follow-up uh, visit doesn't necessarily include time for cognitive testing, um, so that's far less feasible in many cases as compared to um, something like an annual wellness visit, which is um, structured by uh, Medicare to include cognitive screening. We also had some challenges with coordinating, uh, coordinating the study visits um, and research uh, activities using the EMR systems, which are different um, between Thunder Mist and, and Care New England. Um, there have been a number of successes as well. So uh, we have found, as I mentioned, that um, utilizing a combination of, of recruitment approaches has been helpful, um, particularly adding in some direct recruitment within my chart. Um, we have been able to so far uh, stick to our goal of trying to reach underrepresented uh, racial and ethnic groups for the study, and we hope to improve upon that in the next phase. Um, and then we have also gotten a lot of really great feedback so far on the cognitive consultation part of the study, um, where we're actually giving people feedback based primarily on the MOCA um, to tell them how their cognition is doing. And we provide educational materials um, and referrals as needed. Um, we've also been doing exit survey um, and data collection with the participants. I really haven't looked too closely at that yet, but I do see um, so far that our patients are actually reporting that they prefer at-home screening. So this is something that um, is really good that we're, we're taking a look at. Uh, this is just a, a quick snapshot of our um, sort of educational resources. This was developed by my research coordinator, Molly, and one of our former postdocs, uh, Shana and Ronnie. Um, and it's just a seven page booklet that really goes into a lot of information. Um, it has sort of a prevention and early detection focus um, for helping participants understand mild cognitive impairment. So I mentioned we're coming up on phase two of the study. This is um, funded by my K23 grant. Um, a big change for this phase is that we're translating the protocol um, to Spanish and doing some, some focus groups with, with Spanish speaking older adults um, to try to increase, increase the inclusion of um, Hispanic and Latino participants in the study. In phase two, we are also bringing our participants into the memory and aging program um, for a one hour visit where they will get some additional compensation. Um, this visit will include additional cognitive uh, testing with gold standard tools, as well as a blood draw where we'll be looking at uh, plasma biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, including um, PTAU 217, which is supposed to be sensitive at, at early stages of the disease. Uh, and then I'll just take uh, another minute or two to tell you briefly about a survey uh, that I've been working on. This is a collaboration um, with Dr. Matt Howe, who's one of our recent um, fellows, medical fellows here in the Memory and Aging Program. Um, and this study was really prompted because, you know, we want to know uh, a bit more about the, um, the local primary care setting that we're working with um, and trying to do implementation research in, in this type of um, environment, which at least for me is a new, uh, new area to be working. So we developed a five minute online survey um, for primary care providers, specifically for those in Rhode Island, um, asking questions about their patient population, their level of experience with cognitive screening and addressing memory concerns. Um, questions about barriers and other issues of managing patients um, with cognitive decline. 
Thus far, we have received 20, uh, 42 responses. Only 26 of those have been 100% complete. Um, so even though the survey is brief, uh, we do have a number of, of responses where people are only getting about halfway through. Um, and we have uh, thus tried to update the survey um, to ask uh, some other questions about different um, uh, biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease and novel therapies that are now available for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and we're kind of redistributing it um, to make a different um, pitch for recruitment. We'll skip over a couple of things here. Um, just looking at the preliminary data, um, as I mentioned, you know, we, we only have a small number of responses, um, but the results are, are really interesting already. Um, we are seeing that the number one barrier to conducting cognitive screening so far um, is just not having enough time during the appointment. Um, also, another time-related barrier up there is not having enough time for counseling after testing. So, you know, if you do a, a five-minute cognitive screen, it shows there's impairment, you know, then what? Um, you have to have a conversation with the patient about that and find a specialist potentially to refer them to. And that's a very um, time-consuming process. And then another barrier uh, at the referral stage uh, revealed itself here was uh, long wait times. So this was the number one reason that people said they um, had difficulty referring patients with cognitive concerns. Um, so, you know, making a referral to a neurologist, a neuropsychologist, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, there's just not enough providers um, and there are a lot of um, wait lists even here at the um, memory and aging program, we have we have quite a, a wait list to get people in. So that's another really big barrier. So helping um, the survey is helping us to understand, you know, some of these local challenges. Um, and I think that's a really important sort of uh, piece of this work and shift towards looking at earlier detection and prevention um, in the primary care setting. So we're trying to increase our recruitment uh, for the survey. We are looking at some different groups that we can um, uh, advertise the survey in. We've added um, a $500 gift card raffle, um, which was a recommendation from my mentor, um, Dr. Elwi. Um, we've been presenting about the study in different contexts, including in the Rhode Island Department of Health um, Advisory Council for Alzheimer's and Related Dementia. And so we're hopeful that in 2024, we'll get some more responses and, and be able to publish um, the results of this survey and, and also share it back with the um, community and with our um, providers. Um, so that, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank in particular Advanced CTR for uh, funding the pilot project um, and Molly Lawrence, my study coordinator, um, as well as Dr. Elway and Dr. Eaton, who have been my um, primary mentors for this pilot project. And then we'll end there. Hey, well, thank you. Thanks, thanks so much, Dr. Thompson. It's very uh, an important project for the uh, for our community and uh, and very timely uh, approaches in terms of trying to take advantage of the digi digital technology that is becoming you know more and more uh, commonplace. So um, we have uh, uh, a question here that uh, from, from Ronnie again, uh, these barriers are indeed going to be hard to overcome. You mentioned that patients like doing the screening at home. Do you see a future where screening is done at home and follow-up can be with a non-physician? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I think that um, we have the technology, uh, and and older adults have you know adequate access to technology in many cases to do that screening remotely. Um, the big issue is relying on something that is remote um, to determine whether or not somebody needs a follow up um, evaluation can be tricky um, because we don't know. Is the participant, um, you know, doing something at home to help themselves out? Are they writing down answers? Is a caregiver filling it out? Is their grand grandchild filling out the the tool for them? Um, and particularly in neuropsychology, we really get worried about these kind of contextual variables that can impact um, testing and and especially using a screening tool. Um, it's just a cutoff that we're looking at. You know, is a person 
um, below or above the cutoff, and we don't want to, um, you know, overlook somebody who who might actually be impaired or or you know, um, you know, uh, say that they don't need follow up um, when in fact we should really be doing more screening. So I think that for now, the best approach is to do this uh, at home screening and in clinic and continue to compare those two and kind of understand um, how, how well we can um, rely on those remote data before we implement them. Thank you. Uh, any speculation as to why uh, the participation of males has been as high as you've observed? Is it yeah, I don't. I really don't know. Um, it's you know, it's still early in the study, um, so we we may see that shift over time. Um, Presum but especially, presumably, it's not due to biased demographics in those particular providers or something like that. Yeah, that's something actually we we should look at. I don't know. It may be that some of those providers do have a higher proportion of male um, patients, um, so that could could be explaining it. Uh, and uh, again, it's sort of you, you have limited data so far, and the, and the survey will, will might, might help on this. But uh, with regards to this particular approach and study, do you, uh, you have some idea as to what the optimal provider profile would look like you know, in terms of type of practice and, or geographical location, or you know, that, along those lines? That might might be you know that might be helpful in terms of targeting. Uh, outreach to those particular groups. Yeah, well, one one area where I think we would really like to increase our, um, you know, recruitment and representation in the study is in private practices. Um, so we know, you know, from our survey that the providers who are in group practices that are affiliated with academic institutions um, or large hospital settings are more likely to be doing cognitive screening, whereas our national data shows that. Um, you know, in contrast, those in private practice may be uh, less likely to do cognitive screening. And so we want to hear from, from those providers and get them involved in the study so that we can see if we can um, use these tools in uh, the context of, of actual uh, routine clinical care work where screening isn't typically done. No, that's good. Yeah, yeah, excellent point. Again, thank you, Dr. Thompson, for uh, really... Uh, interesting presentation and uh, we wish you best of luck in uh, you know, pursuing this further. Uh, I'll just uh, end the session with a reminder to everyone uh, that the uh, next seminar is scheduled for March 14th and we have a, a distinguished lecture that will be presented by Dr. Jody Rich uh, and the title of his talk will be The Opioid and Overdose Crisis in Rhode Island and Beyond, an update. So please uh, I'll make every effort to try to join us uh, for that uh, presentation. Again, I, I want to thank the uh, presenters today and all the uh, uh, the participants uh, and and uh, Ronnie for her questions uh, and comments. Uh, so it's so been very helpful. Appreciate your uh, participation and look forward to uh, seeing you next month. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity.